Okay, welcome to another update on Archmage Rises, and uh, we are continuing to work on Build 11 for everybody, just grinding away on getting all the features working and everything, and uh, there's really nothing more to say about that. Uh, how, how's that going, Nick? Uh, it's going great. <laughs> I've gotten a ton done since the last uh, update. Yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah, and, uh, yeah. so we built all kinds of new features, which we highlighted through our various video updates. If you look in the uh, library of video updates, um, tons and tons and tons of new features. And now we have to make them all actually work together. And, uh, and that is uh, a lot of work, and so there's not really much to say or show. Uh, you know, we could do an update video that's like, hey, remember that thing we talked about in May? Here it is again, but now it works. <laughs> so that's not a very fun uh, video. So um, we thought we would uh, continue with uh, doing the team, in it, meeting the team. And uh, this week, uh, this guy's in the hot seat. Um, so uh, when we yeah, were interviewing... Time roast. Yeah, time for the roast. So we were uh, <laughs> doing the uh, Roger Art interview. And, uh, and he joked that, uh, hey, we should probably interview Thomas. And uh, so I put that out to the fans and they put in a bunch of questions. And so you guys are going to take it from here and uh, fire away with the questions. Okay. Right. This one is from Will Sama. What is your favorite video game, Thomas? Uh, that's a tough one uh, because it's it constantly changes. But I'm going to go with Medieval Total War. Um, I just had amazing memories playing Medieval Total War. I mean, I had amazing memories playing WoW and amazing memories playing StarCraft and, and stuff, but Medieval Total War, I, I really felt like I was a medieval king. I was there, mm -hmm. man. I was there. <laughs> okay. Where did you grow up, by the way? Um, so I was born in uh, well, a little town outside of Toronto. Um, it was not very big, but then I spent all my life growing up in the Hamilton area, which is uh, about an hour away from Toronto. And that's where I went to school and, um, and then started to get work. Uh, I worked in Toronto proper um, and then got married and we lived in the suburbs of Toronto. And the uh, place where we lived is called Burlington. And the reason I chose Burlington was because it was the last stop on the train. <laughs> so there was no <laughs> way I was going to be driving to Toronto. It's two and a half, three hours in traffic in and two and a half, three hours out. And there's no yeah. way I was going to sit through that. So uh, when I was uh, engaged to my wife, I said, okay, I think we should live in Burlington because I'm probably always going to have a job in Toronto. So let's do that. And then uh, sure enough, here I am um, now a year. Um, I've moved away from Toronto and live in the middle of nowhere in northern Ontario uh, in right. a town, town of 400 with super slow internet. <laughs> yeah, we noticed. Yeah. <laughs> Will Sama uh, asks, "What do you play these days apart from RimWorld?" He's been paying attention. He has been, been paying attention. I like that our fans are paying attention. Okay, I see you come up every time on Steam. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> uh, so I do play uh, a lot of RimWorld, especially recently. Um, but uh, the other things I'm playing is uh, Warhammer Total War. Uh, you see a bit of a trend there. Basically, if they release a Total War game, I buy it. That's uh, pretty much a rule <laughs> of the household. Um, so right. I'm really enjoying Total War uh, Warhammer um, because I don't really have time to play games um, with my family and businesses and the game and everything. I, I don't get a lot of chance. So I'm like way behind on my game list. Um, and so I, I signed up for the uh, Humble Monthly and I got Total Wars, uh, the Warhammer Total War. I was so happy. And then still had to wait three months before I finally found <laughs> some time to actually sit down and play it. So, um, and then for some reason that I cannot describe, I've known Nick for, I don't know, four years, five years. He said in his video five years, so I guess I'll just have to back him up with that. So, so I've known Nick for five years. We've been working on the game for over a year, a uh, year and a half almost. Or almost we're going to be coming up to two years. We've never played a video game together not once and then uh, mm -hmm. it was like hey why don't, you got overwatch and i got overwatch like why don't we play overwatch and so we've been playing War overwatch every night for the last 10 days mm -hmm. really yeah it's a lot <laughs> okay. of fun <laughs> nice okay so well uh, game bone game bone tree hugger wants to know what do you for well what do you do for fun i guess playing overwatch is one of them yeah, I guess I'll take it in terms of non-video games. Um, I, I really enjoy um, board games. Um, so, 
you know, if he's looking for an answer outside of gaming in general, um, then I would say uh, I enjoy cycling. Um, I have a lot of fond memories of uh, just cycling around this uh, island that I'm currently living on and um, listening to a podcast or a book on on tape, um, audiobook or something. And yeah, I just really enjoy that. Okay, cool. Are you any good at that foosball table back there? Oh, I love foosball. I should have said foosball. <laughs> I love yeah. foosball. And I'm quite good at foosball. <laughs> and so that means no one will play me. And so, yeah. Right. Um, so, now my wife is quite good at foosball. Okay. So you can measure the level of education someone has by their pool skills or their foosball skills. Okay. Because <laughs> they spend a lot of time in the student rec center. And so, my wife has upwards of nine years of university. And uh, yeah. she has three or four degrees at this point. So she is quite good at the foosball, but I can crush her at the foosball. So she never wants to play. Man, I must be stupid then. I played you foosball last time you were in Portland and me and my wife were playing against you. So you had to use all four and, and you still destroyed us. It was <laughs> close. And you, were just getting, you were just getting warmed up though. It, it was yeah. good. That was a good time. Pretty bad. That. <laughs> so he also wants to know, um, or am I now stealing your question, Nick? Yeah, I don't steal my questions. Yeah. <laughs> That's mine. Game Boone Tree Hugger asks, how many hours a week do you work on AR? Not enough is the right answer. And um, I would say, now, I'm going to tell the truth here. I probably work 30 hours a week on, on Archmage, um, which, is, which is disappointing. But as I kind of mentioned, with all my other responsibilities, um, like after right after this interview, I gotta go make dinner for all the animals. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. You also run a zoo, right? I do run a zoo at my house. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I have uh, three kids <laughs> and my wife and my my mother all living with me, um, and uh, and then I have uh, three other businesses, and uh, those interrupt and whatever. So I, I get about thirty hours a weekend, and and that was one of the reasons why I hired Nick um, because my wife is looking at me. She's like when are you ever going to finish this thing? And I'm like, yeah, I know. When am I ever going to finish this thing? If only, if only I had a full-time program or working on this thing, we'd be done in like six, nine months. Now, <laughs> I, I, I didn't hire, I guess, a fast enough programmer because here we no. are like a year yeah. and a half later. Uh, two years and, later. Yeah, yeah I'm still working on it. But anyway, um, you know, so when I get pulled off uh, for something, uh, like my kids were sick earlier this week and I was up till 4 a.m. with both of them throwing up simultaneously into two separate buckets, um, mm -hmm. So while I'm like, well, <laughs> at least Nick will be waking up tomorrow and working on the game <laughs> while, I, <laughs> while I'm dealing with all this. Right. Okay, so Will Sam also wants to know, if you had to pick just one, uh, which turn-based game would you uh, award for having the best UI GUI? Um, I will have to go with Total War. And I know that I've already said that one. Um, it's not the only game I've played. I have played XCOM, Nick. <laughs> Good. <laughs> with dashes and without. Um, okay. So uh, the Total War games, they have a lot of depth. They have tons of features. They have uh, different units you can create, different generals. The generals have hangers on. Um, they have their own stats. They have research. Uh, the Rome one has a whole Senate and family history. Like, it just goes on and on and on with all these features. And while I'm sure nobody is uh, giving them any awards for their UI, um, the, uh, I, I, I like how tight it is and accessible. Um, I, I think that they are much more uh, functionality than um, uh, than kind of artsy kind of company. Like they're yeah more about how it plays than necessarily how it looks. Um, and right. so I, I I go to them first to see like what did they do, how did they do it. Um, and so for instance, the the way that our land management is in Archmage Rises um, comes from the way the land management is in Rome Total War Two. Uh, for instance, right. it's it's kind of my version of, of what they did there. Also, which turn-based game would you pick for the best gameplay award? Um, I'm trying to think of a better answer than XCOM. <laughs> uh, Super Mario. Yeah, because Super Mario is turn-based. Um, All right. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm going to pick uh, something else. The uh, the paradox. Uh, interactive titles um you know the uh crusader kings 2 i'm gonna say crusader kings 2 even though mm -hmm. i still don't know how to play it 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but I know it's awesome as I'm trying to play it, and uh, it's just uh, it's really impressive and um, and really cool. All right. Okay. Which game would you pick for having the best procedural story? And Archmage Rises is not an app. Oh, um, I'm going to say Crusader Kings 2 again. <laughs> um, okay. And uh, I, I got a lot of information from their GDC talk um, about kind of procedural story. Um, that They wouldn't even say they were trying to do that. It was more kind of a... a a natural outcome of the systems that they put into that game, um, and and that was very encouraging uh, as I as I watched that and saw you know just how attached the fans got to the stories based on all these uh, systems coming into relationship, and I was like, okay, cool, um, yeah. So, uh, how long have you been making games? Uh, since 2012. So this is my fifth year uh, making games. Uh, how I did made... you get into it? Um, I have been in, in software development um, for a lo many years. Um, I started programming when I was six um, in uh, BASIC on my uh, TRS-80 co uh, computer that had a cassette drive uh, <laughs> attached to it, attached to the TV. And um, uh, I, I wouldn't say that I really knew what I was doing or, or anything, but uh, um, I, I've just always been fascinated with programming and trying to make games, which was a reason to learn how to program. Um, mm -hmm. And so as I went down that path, I, I ended up working um, during the web bubble uh, of the late 90s. And so in Toronto, um, as all these websites were being made, and I remember it wasn't our client, but someone um, built a five-page website for uh, Wonder Bra for $50,000. And Sarah Lee the food company owns Wonder Bra and Sarah Lee got a five page website for 50 more thousand dollars. Um, wow. So those just crazy money being thrown around. Um, you know, we all know about the dot com bubble and stuff. So, um, yeah. So yeah, so I, I worked in that. I, I worked as a programmer, then as a team lead, then as a director. Um, and then I worked uh, at another dot com uh, e-commerce company as a programmer, then a team lead, then a manager. Uh, then I left and started my own business and was a programmer, then really a team lead, and then the manager. All the rats, right? So, <laughs> so I always seem to end up in the same kind of place, which is more like overseeing and guiding something than actually mm -hmm. doing it. Um, mm -hmm. Right. And you guys have noticed that. And you're like, what does Thomas actually do? And my answer is, I hire you guys. That's what I do. <laughs> Um, Just sit there, pick his nose. <laughs> that's right. So, um, so around 2012, I, I was just tired of building business software. Um, I had been doing it at that point for almost 20 years, and uh, I was like, if if I'm going to make a big change, why not do the dream job that I've always wanted to do? And so, mm -hmm. um, mobile was exploding. It seemed like if anybody just would make a mobile game, they'd be a bazillionaire. So why mm -hmm. not me? Um, and uh, and so then I, I made two mobile games, um, and uh, and then thought I'd never make a game again, and uh, and then uh, I had a chance to uh, start working on something, and so I started working on what became Archmage Rises. Uh, how do dice treat you when playing games? Randrog asks. Um, I don't usually notice, um, but like I seem to be okay in role playing games. But when I'm playing <clears throat> Access and Allies, which is one of my favorite games to play of all time, um, I have a, a little uh, annual tradition where we play Access and Allies at Christmas time. So mm -hmm. it's Christmas time. Let's see if the Germans can win over the world. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. Uh, so I, I play that with a certain group of friends every year, and um, in that game, getting ones is really important because you always want to roll under a certain number, and mm -hmm. I'm rolling sixes all the time, all the time. <laughs> and when I'm playing Warhammer 40K or Warhammer Fantasy, and I want to get sixes in order to do an armor save and stuff, I'm rolling ones all the time. So right. uh, I don't know what it is. Um, I own probably 70 different D6s, and I'll just keep working my way through them until I find ones that, <laughs> that will roll low like I want or high like I want but can't trust them, them dice <laughs> okay so Brandon Marsh uh, wants to know what it was like owning a game shop because maybe we should get into it or maybe you already did in some other video but at some time you owned a game shop right that's right 
Um, so while I was building my software company, I decided I wasn't busy enough. Um, I didn't have any kids at that point, and so I decided to also open a, a game shop uh, at the same time. And I thought I would sell a lot of things online, and maybe in hindsight I should have focused more on that. But once <laughs> once I right. opened the game shop, uh, it became all-consuming. Um, and so I, uh, I'll throw up some pictures of the game shop um, here for people to see. Um, so when I opened the game shop, I'm like, well, I'm going to open the greatest game shop the world has ever seen. And uh, and so we did. And uh, people come play Magic and Warhammer and Flames of War and all uh, board games and stuff. And, um, and so it was a ton of work and it was fun. But the big thing that I've taken away from that is that all work is work. So even like owning a game shop seems like be super fun and I'm surrounded by miniature paints and brushes and uh, rule books and RPG books and I can order anything I want and put it on the shelf and look at it all day long. It's still work. Like when somebody buys it, right. you have to know that you sold that, how much you sold it for, should I get another one, um, yeah. place that order, you find out it's out of print, try another supplier, <laughs> like like there's mm -hmm. there's work no matter what you do. And so um, yeah. going into game making, like video game making, uh, it's the same thing. It's like, yeah, I spent a bunch of time this week working on the food systems and what the recipes are and which ingredients go into which recipe. And it's, it's tedious work, <laughs> like trying to figure mm -hmm. all that stuff out and try to balance it and, and all that stuff. Um, but uh, I am proud to say that the game store was uh, very, very well received. Um, not in really a financial way, but in terms of building a community, um, we would run events um, that would 75, 100 people would come out to play board games all on the same day or, or play Warhammer all on the same day. And we were renting halls and such. And um, real friendships developed out of that. Like there were, there's a lot of people that I know that made lifelong friendships out of that game store. And oh, that's uh, pretty cool. Uh, mm -hmm. People have gone to people's weddings. Um, I remember I started getting into fitness and uh, calorie counting and uh, did some posts on the forums that we had. And another guy read that and lost 100 pounds based on wow. uh, oh, wow. what I had put there. So, like, yeah, it's it's really cool. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the internet killed us. Um, you know, we would have customers that are like, why would I pay $55 for it on the shelf when I can get it online for 35 or 39 And, right. uh, you know, we would... We would try to match prices online, um, you know. But if you're only making five bucks on a thing, and that thing costs yeah. fifty dollars and sits on a shelf for two months, um, right. it's it's uh, it's way hard in order to do it. when it ends. Mm -hmm. So um, so the long and short of it is that uh, we f we uh, shut it down. Um, I, I had a business People partner. Like Nick. Pardon? People like Nick killed it. You yeah, don't want to leave the house and just mm -hmm. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Nick killed the friendly local gaming store. No. Um, so, anyways, uh, yeah. So we shut it down uh, February of last year. What's next? Um, Randrog asks, any more uh, advances on pulling your kids in into the <laughs> RPG world? Um, not so much because they are still just as young as they are. Um, mm -hmm. he's, he's referring to uh, my bedtime stories, which are actually mm -hmm. secretly D and D sessions with the kids, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> without any dice rolling. But I was at Gen Con. Oh, we lost him. Uh oh. I was at Gen back. Con, and I got giant fuzzy dice. <laughs> oh, my uh, gosh. So, so now at bedtime, the kids can roll and uh, and you know. I'm gonna figure out some kind of way to introduce die rolling into the bedtime stories, and nice. that way, that way, by at least the time that they're six, they will be ready to rock and roll at D and D. <laughs> Got to prime the pump. <laughs> That's right. All right. Okay. So let's move on to some questions about Archmage Rises. Although I think we, no? um, the first question is from Rendrog, who says or asks, "What art, books, movies?" Fever dreams <laughs> have influenced you uh, on Archmage Rises. Um, I have uh, been pretty uh, open about the Dragonlance uh, influence and how uh, Raceland from Dragonlance has, has been a big source. Um, the the moment in which I kind of, for lack of a better term, got a vision of Archmage Rises, like almost in its complete form, um, I was reading the uh, book uh, Soulforge by uh, Margaret Weiss. 
um, and it's a story about Raceland and how he was kind of growing up in the early years, like his formative years. And I was like, man, it would be so cool to play a game where you could like do that, like basically become from nothing to this super archmage. So that's kind of where the name comes from and, and everything. Um, and you know, putting that aside, I, I would say you know Gandalf coming from Lord of the Rings, um, but. It, and then it starts to get really hard because it's basically anything and everything that I touch is an influence. Um, I'll be right. watching uh, the TV show Suits and something will happen in the TV show. I'm like, ooh, that's kind of cool. I could make, a, could make a story out of that in the emergent story system, you know, in Archmage. So um, right. I, I am drawing <clears throat> from everything, ev everything that everything I can. And every yeah. Mm -hmm. Really cool. Uh, Brendan Marsh asks, what games or mechanics inspired you? Um, I would say the uh, Gold Box uh, SSI role playing games gave kind of um, what I would call a base um, to it because those games are super fast to play if you know exactly what you want to do. Um, because they were designed on computers that ran in like eight megahertz and stuff, mm -hmm. right? And so, so like you would choose to like go to camp and then it would be like a loading screen for 10 seconds and then you'd be in the mm -hmm. camp thing and, and then you would choose like uh, some option. You have to wait for the screen to redraw and then you could choose your next option. <laughs> so anyway, they actually played super fast if you had a fast enough processor and such. So um, there was just something about that, even using the keyboard keys that um, was just uh, great to be able to play that so quickly. So um, mm -hmm. Skyrim uh, and its openness and kind of its questing uh, system. Um, and The Sims. The Sims is a, a huge influence in terms of uh, how the AI people work and how I want them to work. Because you're playing The Sims and someone comes and knocks on your door and starts you know, urinating on your couch or something <laughs> like that. Um, you know, like I, there's some series of, of random uh, numbers that were rolled or, or uh, you know, decision trees or something that, that caused that to happen, um, the player doesn't care. Um, they just see the end result and go, hey! And then, you know, there's kind of a story that, that comes out of that. And so, um, you know, whenever I get discouraged or stuck uh, on Archmage, I'll go back and look at, uh, you know, The Sims, maybe I'll play The Sims for an hour or two and just go, oh yeah, oh yeah, it is possible to really <laughs> make the people feel real without them actually being, you know, real people. Um, right. And finally, I'll, I'll mention uh, the Guild and the Guild Two um, because those are lesser-known games that are have this incredible role-playing and yet trading economy side to them. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you can eventually become mayor of the town if you work the political system. And so, like, it's really weird. You marry, you have kids, and all kinds of stuff. So there's like a lot of things in there that I've tried to pull in Archmage um, as well because most people won't play the Guild games. So. I'll give them a little feel of the guild games as, as they play their Archmage. So really, you get two games in one. When you, when you drop your 30 bucks, I mean, it's really well worth it. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, Will Sama wants to know, um, can you please stop fish, uh, focusing on fishing and just focus on Bill 11? So, well, I think okay. everybody wants to know. Well, here, here's something kind of funny. So I put down the fishing thing and I started working on the food thing, right? That uh, you're able to get food at the inns and, you know, this food does that and that food does that. And then I'm like, hmm, what are the ingredients in there? I know, fish. So <laughs> I managed to take my current task and loop it back into working on the fishing again. <laughs> uh, well, Salma asked, when is Build 11 coming out? Oh, as soon as uh, Nick finishes it. I mean, we're all waiting. We're all waiting for Build 11. <laughs> I'm working on it. Yeah. Come on, Nick. Hurry um, up. It's, uh, it's going slowly. Um, for one reason, is because we're trying to get all these disparate systems to work together. And second is because we're still adding some new things, even though, even though we're not supposed to be adding any new things. But um, in order for the well-being system, I, I really want to get the well-being system working. Like, if your character's happy, then there's bonuses. If you're unhappy, there's uh, certain things that are bad about that. In order for that to work, we had to have a way in order to um, both increase and decrease your well-being, and that way is through food. In order to do the mm -hmm. food, we had to have the ingredients, and the ingredients are tied to things you can forage on the hexes. And so now mm -hmm. I'm busy putting in the foraging on hexes in order mm -hmm. to get the well-being system to work. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's taken a while, and all I can say is, I hope and expect and counting on that when Build 11 comes out, people will say on the forums, oh, it was worth it. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, well, so when it comes out, what will be your favorite activity in Build 11? Um, I can't say fishing. I think you put that in says I can't say fishing. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I think and hope it's the well-being system. Um, because that has been part of the design for years, from the very mm-hmm. beginning, and now I'm finally implementing it. So if it's not my right. favorite system, I've really screwed up somehow. <laughs> it was clearly well, not worth Well, there's always the build 12. That's right. right. <laughs> yes. Well, it's all I'm going to ask. Um, if you had to pick just one, which ad- uh, addition, including build 11, would you highlight? Fishing is not an answer. Um... Cooking. <laughs> I just spent a, I just spent a lot of time on the cooking, and uh, yeah. it's a whole subsystem in and of itself. There, there are now recipes that you can learn and find, and uh, yeah. So I, I, I'm happy to finally deliver on a good uh, food cooking, in experience. Mm-hmm. Okay, and uh, which weapon would be uh, would would you highlight for build eleven? Uh, we haven't done the weapons. Can't say fishing rod or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we haven't done the weapons yet, so I, I can't answer that. Item? Yeah, we haven't Maybe. really done the items yet. We put a grinder in there, but we haven't. Yeah, put the in, portable grinder, right? We Since put the last the video, we put grind. in a portable grinder. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and we we've got a you know a small amount of items. We've got like nets, you know, you can use to capture people and fishing poles for fishing. Oh, we can't say that. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Um, we've got, you know, crowbars and keys. We've got some stuff, but definitely we need to, we need to add content. And that's, uh, we haven't been focusing on content. It's all been mostly systems. Um, but the content is coming. Yeah. Right. And, and that's why, like, working on the food thing, I'm like, I'm not just throwing in three recipes like uh, we have been in the past to just kind of get mm-hmm. something going. Like the Mage Tower is a great example of where we made a couple of rooms. So, you, okay, look, it's a Mage Tower. You can build some rooms and we moved mm-hmm. on to other features, right? I'm trying right. to uh, this time be more complete about it, that you have a more complete mm-hmm. experience. Um, and so uh, you, we're going to circle back. There's a bunch of rooms that are coming as part of this mm-hmm. to, uh, you know, feed the grinder. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. uh, and, you know, like we have to add the kitchen and uh, there's different levels of kitchen based on the recipes, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera. Right. So, so we're working all that content right mm-hmm. now. Okay. So... Um, what will be the following? Uh, what will be the task that you'll be working on for the following weeks? Um, so after we get build eleven done, um, we are going to focus on uh, probably probably we're going to focus on the dungeons um, and really getting the dungeons up to par because um, we're we're going to make some changes to the dungeon system and uh, we're going to update yeah. the graphics. Um, you know. It, 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 what we have is is not where it needs to be at, so we're uh, we're gonna really Im- improve the dungeons. I agree. Uh, Brendan Marsh asks, can you give us some background and introduce some of the, uh, some more of the lore? I would love to. I could probably spend thirty minutes just talking about mm-hmm. that, and maybe that should be <laughs> one of the update videos. Um, but uh, I'll just give uh, the kind of the two minute version is um, you are born into this world. And you're born into at a very specific time uh, within that world. And so we, meaning myself and Andrew, the writer, um, we had to go back and go, okay, well, what happened in the world up until that point? Like what, there's a conclave. Why is there a conclave? And, and what led to there being a conclave? And as we started to fill in that stuff, um, it started to create interesting um, stories just, you know, to kind of read and, and that's interesting, but also created interesting stories for within the game. And um, and that to me is kind of the, the best and most interesting part of the lore is that if you go and read all the history of Valon uh, from the moment it was settled by the very first peoples that kind of showed up on the shore, all the way through the Mage War years, through the Free Cities, um, to the current Conclave uh, alliance, uh, kind of Uh, It's kind of a cold war between the nobles and the conclave um, all the way through to that Then it just really helps explain why the game plays the way that it plays um, Because because it's set in a very specific setting and so um, to Become a rebel and undo the conclave like basically destroy it 
is really interesting in this larger context of the world. Or to become head of the Conclave and uh, get rid of all the rebels also becomes a very interesting uh, thing to do within the game. So that's about all I can say right now. All right. Well, Brandon Marshall also wants to know, like, how random are the events uh, versus the illusion of choice? Um, yeah, so overall, I would say design-wise, Archmage is not very random. Um, would you agree with that, Nick? Um, I guess it's hard. It's, it depends on what you're talking about. When it comes to the systems, they're a very specific vision, I would say. But when it comes to, like, pulling content, I believe it's 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 fairly random as far as, like... Yeah. It's hard to ask, you know? It, you have to balance that randomness with with pulling things in that make sense in the world itself. Otherwise, your changes, the things you do, don't make a difference. Yeah. So. Maybe I can give, can give an example. So if your NPC wife divorces you, um, that is not random. That is not like we rolled a die and mm -hmm. it rolled a one and we're like, okay, she divorces you. There's, mm -hmm. there's things and reasons that led to that. Um, mm -hmm. Whether the player really knows it like meaning were they paying attention um mm -hmm. so anytime something happens within the game there's some kind of reason behind it and if you are paying attention you can see it coming um mm -hmm. another example is uh if you were to um we're never going to have a random event that kills the player for instance um because that would be extraordinarily unfair especially in a mm -hmm. death game uh, be super frustrating right so mm -hmm. so we have these kind of constraints that the player has to choose something and then maybe it goes poorly for them and they die. So uh, mm -hmm. for instance, right. you're, you're in the dungeon. If you open a trapped thing, it immediately does a whole bunch of damage on you. Um, and uh, there's a range in that damage. So if you are opening things in the dungeon and you only have three hit points and you die and lose your character, like that, you could see that coming. Like that was mm -hmm. your choice to do that. Um, mm -hmm. There's never a trap that is equal to your max HP that can kill you. And so that's why mm -hmm. I don't feel that Archmage has a lot of randomness to it. It, it has a lot of reasons that things happen to you. Um, mm -hmm. And we, of course we have to use randomness, but um, but we try to use systems more than randomness. Brendan Marsh asks, how big of a task is it to procedurally generate a world? It is a massive task mm -hmm. to procedurally generate a world. Um, I would say that uh, well, I, I was watching a GDC talk of the uh, founders of uh, LucasArts. Um, they, they were Lucasfilm Games for a while, and then you know it kind of became its own thing, LucasArts. And um, they built this multiplayer environment. If, if anybody's watched Halt and Catch Fire uh, Season 2, where they had uh, Mutiny, um, and they were running this whole online chat, uh, selling things, whatever system, using Commodore 64s, uh, LucasArts built that. They actually built this thing called Habitat, and you could have avatars that walked around and talked with people, all on 300 baud modems, and uh, you know the 64K RAM, and a disk drive, right? Like, like that's what they had. And they said, well, we were so foolish that we didn't know we couldn't do it. So we did. Mm -hmm. So we built this online community with a 300 baud modems and a Commodore 64. So that's kind of my feeling about this whole world generation thing was like when I started the project, I was foolish enough to think that I can do this. And so here we are doing it. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and so, yeah, it's it's a lot of work and um, my single largest task to, uh, to get right. Um, because if we get that right, the game will shine unbelievably well. And if we get it wrong, then it's not worth anyone's time or money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Except for the artwork. Uh -oh. The artwork will uh -oh. always be nice. All right. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. And would you feel terrible at the about the variety of fish? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. No, I will not feel terrible about the variety of fish because <laughs> I knew that I did the best job I could when it came to building the fishing system. You do know you have a fish expert on the team, right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. And Nick is always there. I can always <laughs> ask him. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the fish went to sleep. The fish went Speaking to sleep. Which, it's that late already. Wow. Uh, Randrog asks, are the results of the die in AR based on the physical roll of the die on the screen, or is the screen roll tied to a generated number? We did ask this last week. 
Yeah. Um, actually, uh, I wondered if there was a difference between random number generator and physical die rolls. So I actually sat down one time and uh, rolled a whole bunch of dice and recorded them in Excel. And, uh, and then took that table and put that into the game. And so anytime that you needed a random number, it would pull it from the table of actual die rolls. And what I found was it was no better than just using the random number generator. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't play any better or worse, but at least, at least I knew for sure. Mm -hmm. All right. Are you happy with uh, how the game is shaping up? Um, yes. I am. Um, in terms of speed, I really wish that we were done. I didn't know I was going to be doing a marathon four or five year, um, you know, build on this thing. I don't think my wife did either when I said, hey, let's spend some money and make this thing. Uh, you know, never told Roger it would go on this long. Uh, he likes to be uh, in and done, I guess, in a few months, yeah. <laughs> move on to the next project. So, right. um, so yeah. Um, but when I, I look at Okay, so first of all, the game that I was trying to make initially um, was actually less of a game. Uh, I mean, lesser in terms of features, in terms of um, the graphics and all these things, right? And so as we've gone along, Archmage has been telling me what it wants to be. And mm -hmm. I have to listen to that instead of just doing what I initially wanted to do. Um, and so one example of that is... Uh, of the inventory system. Um, so I did not want to have individual inventory items kind of listed out with an icon and all this stuff. But it just forced me into doing that. I mean, and I <laughs> tried to think of every way possible to get around doing it. And I could not think of a way to, to get around it. And so finally I was like, fine, we'll put in an inventory system just like WoW and Pillars of Eternity and all these other games. Skyrim and whatever, and um, and so now we have, and now we you know, have icons for them. And totally now, makes me happy, man. Now we have to get Roger <laughs> to draw all these icons and stuff. And so this is an, an example of how um, is it what I wanted to make or expected to make? No. Is it better than what I expected to make? Yes, um, I, I can 100% say that. So. Uh, I'm, I'm happy with the inventory system, the ability to drag and drop and put things on your quick bar and like all kinds of stuff. It's just, <laughs> this, this is why like when we were at Gen Con the first time, we're like, hey, we're going to be done in February next year and stuff. And here, and we, here we are, uh, like, you know, almost a year after that February. Um, and I know everybody knows that, that game development tends to go long, but, but this is the reason why, because you're not, you're getting way more game um, yeah. than, than what was uh, initially envisioned or promised. Um, but, you know, I, I think that it will stand for itself when, it, when it's done. Um, you know, and if it takes a while to get there, uh, then unfortunately it takes a while to get there. But um, mm -hmm. to, uh, to cut corners is not worthwhile. Like, if I was making a clone of something else, like I was, we were making this Diablo clone or something like that, then it would... Um, I don't know, people like playing Diablo anyway. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, right. if we cut some corners in it, it's like, well, people just like playing this kind of thing anyway and stuff. But we're creating something totally new. And if we cut some corners, I guess it's a little bit like VR. Like, if you make cheap VR, people get mm -hmm. sick and they never want a VR again, right? And so, <laughs> so we're, we're trying to make emergent story and AI that is passion-driven and uh, a generated world that's always different every time. So if I cheap out on any of these things, then people go, well, clearly that doesn't work, right? Mm -hmm, I don't right. know, but let's say uh, Bethesda is watching this, you know, every single week. They're like, what's going on with Archmage? You know, should we mm -hmm. make some changes in the next uh, Elder Scrolls game, um, right? And if we totally muck it up, then they're going to be like, yeah. okay, well, clearly it can't, you know, can't be done or shouldn't be done or whatever and stuff. But if we nail it, like a Rim World or a Stardew Valley or something like that, then that really changes the marketplace. And mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm not trying to be a crusader, uh, but at the same time, I I do think that there's room for great improvement in in uh, game features and stuff. And so mm -hmm. so it's just really important. Just like Oculus, how they were like, we can't release this thing too early. Um, I, I kind of have the same kind of thing because I don't want to turn people off of the whole emergent, random world, all that stuff. Okay. Uh, Randrog asks, orangutans or sloth? Uh, I'm going to go with orangutans for sure. 
hands down. <laughs> Good choice. All right. Well, what will you do when uh, Archmage is done? I'm just going to go visit Roger and hang out in his apartment, uh, sleep <laughs> on his couch, raid his fridge, um, you know. Walk the dog. Walk the dog. Pet the dog. You know, yeah, no, try to earn nice. my keep. I, f I figure three, between three and six months he'll get tired of me and send me home, but um, yeah. so sure. <laughs> um, actually my, uh, my crazy plan, um, and I don't know if it's going to be real or true or what, but anyway, the idea is that um, I am putting everything that I can into Archmage Rises in terms of like every role-playing system I've ever seen or game I've ever played or whatever, like just everything I have to say about role-playing games is, is in Archmage. So when I'm done, I'm going to be empty. Like there's nothing left to say or do like, this is it everybody. Right. And so, uh, I think there's going to be a, a real time of recovery needed. Um, and so, uh, there will be DLC and stuff, um, to, to come out. We, we've been open about some of the stuff that we think would be uh, good for DLC. Um, but I would, I would like to go and just do something totally different uh, for a little while to recover. And that is either to make Archmage Rises the board game or to make a novel set in this, what I say, compelling background world of Archmage Rises. Um, I don't know which one of those um, that I will, I will do. Um, it's still a ways off. I am totally focused on just finishing Archmage and, well, actually I'm focused on build 11 uh, mm -hmm. and then finishing Archmage. But for, for kind of dreaming one day, what will I do after Archmage? That's kind of what I've been thinking of doing. Okay, Sounds I think good. that's it for the questions. All right. Yeah. Good answers. Okay. Well, thank you guys. And uh, thank you everybody for the questions. And uh, we thank you for your continued interest in Archmage as uh, Nick and I slowly work away on Build 11. And uh, mm -hmm. we will get that out. And I think uh, next week... We will circle back and interview our musician, which actually started this whole thing, um, and give him <laughs> a, a real interview, <laughs> and, right. and, um, and that'll complete this uh, meet the team behind Archmage. And then Build 11 is done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hopefully we can sync those things up <laughs> when we're done interviewing team members. Or we'll just keep hiring. We'll just keep adding people to the team. <laughs> just do that. Ready. That's much easier than getting Build 11 done. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> Nice. Okay. Bye, everybody. See ya.